This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. Welcome to Ramdas Here and Now. I'm Raghu Marcus. I have a talk here from way back, September 15th, 1970. This is interesting because it's right before Ramdas went back to India in 1970, because I remember I was in cor- corresponding with him and saying, look, I need to get to Maharaji, so where can I go? And he said, well, I'm going to India this fall, and that was the fall of 70. Write to me when you get there. And I went there a couple of months after in November. So, and this was at the uh, Unitar- at a Unitarian Church in Franklin, New Hampshire. That's where his father's farm was. And uh, I don't know, is this the topic of the thing? Is connecting yoga to our Western religions? I'm not quite sure. That might be just a note that I made about uh, some of what this is about, which is, uh, you know, very uh, the most interesting stuff in here that I really related to was around in the West. He talks about in the West, um, we just didn't have... Uh, the, couldn't provide the wisdom uh, that's necessary to know inner peace. None of these religions, none of these traditions seem to provide that. And as sophisticated as our theories were, he says, they didn't provide, uh, f- uh, you know, fulfillment. And we couldn't hear, we couldn't hear the voice of any of the, the real true inner voice through these religions. Uh, and boy, I mean, I I grew up in Montreal, and I went to a parochial school, a Hebrew school. Now, people go, oh, you went on the weekends, you went to Sunday school. No, I went to school every day, half the day was in Hebrew, and half was in English. In other words, I learned geography in Hebrew, which is really not fun when you're eight years old, nine years old, let me tell you. Um, so I was a bit of a mess. I have, you know, poor dad gets responsibility for that mess. (laughs) Uh, it, it, I mean, it turned me off to school to say the very least. Uh, and then going to the synagogue, which we would go to on the high, the Jewish high holidays. And, you know, all I can remember is like walking in the door with my brother, my little brother and, with my father and there, you know, the usher would meet you and you'd have to show your tickets and boy, they were expensive tickets too, to get into the high holidays. And, and I remember he would take our tickets and get, he was like real close to us and you could smell that horrible halitosis on this guy. He was just, and then so right away I'm turned off. And then all I hear is this didactic kind of stuff coming around and Zionism and God knows I had no relationship with it at all. Only until some of the some of the songs, the chants were fantastic, and I really related with those. And so um, that was my uh, experience that parallels just about everybody else's who who had anything to do with either Christianity, Judaism, or anything here. Um, and Ramdas is saying that's why he went. One of the things was going to India to find people who had, you know, had that true knowledge, um, and and he found yoga, yoga union with God, and he was talking about coming back into the West and coming back into these traditions, and then suddenly he could hear the message: "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one." That, we went there, and Maharaji, all he said every day was, "It's there's Sabek, there's only one, only one. So coming back, there's a completely different way that you hear that, utterly different way that you hear that. Um, and, of course, strange, as he says, it, it was weird to go to the Himalayas to find all that out. I mean, to, to break through the cynicism of, of, of these uh, uh, exoteric religions. Uh, that we were, had been forced upon us. And, and in, you know, in my case, like many others, so coming there, I mean, one of the, and I've said this in uh, previous uh, podcasts, I think in the very early podcasts, I talk about, I talked about how I just wanted a mantra from Maharaji. And the next thing I know, he said, meditate like Christ. When he was nailed to the cross, he felt love, no pain, and he was lost in love with every sentient being and so on. 
which, you know, that was darshan or being in the presence of that being. And I had no relationship with that. In fact, when I was in that parochial school, uh, Hebrew school, uh, you know, Christ was a bad guy. I mean, literally. I mean, it was just unbelievable. So, after this experience, of course, you know, things completely changed. Not only did, did Maharaji give us the true concept of Christ or that being, which is the same as Hanuman, a true, utterly true servant of God and wanting nothing for oneself. So the complete um, getting rid of self-interest it was the path, is the path for everybody. And, uh, and at the same time, uh, Maharaji really uh, gave us a lot of direct connectivity to the concept of mother too. And in my case, I had actually gone to the, I couldn't get to Maharaji in the first few months, couldn't find him. So I was ended up uh, in something, uh, an ashram called Sri Aurobindo Ashram, seeing uh, a being named Mother. She was Mother. And she was very much that. And I got to have that darshan. And that, that influenced me greatly as Maharaji started talking about Mother and Goddess. And there was Durga, the Goddess Durga, all over the temple, an aspect of her called Vindhya Vasini Mai. And um, so, in, in fact, when I was there, Maharaji said, uh, where were you before? This is when I first got there. Where were you before you came here? And I was, I had been at this Swami Muktananda. Some of you out there will know who that is. Um, his uh, tradition goes on through um, a mother named Chidavilasananda. And uh, so I was going to say, yeah, well, I was just at Muktananda's ashram. And before I could say a word, he looked at me and he pointed his finger at me and went in English, mother. So I knew then, of course, he was, it was just more confirmation. I'm with you every second of your past, present, and future. And I had been there months previously. So that was, a, so that, be, that was a big deal. Sri Ramakrishna was a big part of it as well. Uh, the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, by the way, is a fantastic book about mother, um, this uh, amazing saint near Calcutta. So one good example is that coming back, uh, I came back, uh, and this is many years later, happened to be in India, spending time with our mother in in Kenshi, who is, is still with us today, Sidima. And I came back, and I happened that weekend, for whatever reason, I ended up in a Catholic church, I think it was for uh, some confirmations, and the priest, and I, I don't often go to church, mind you, and the priest started going on about Mother Mary. Well, I'm telling you, <laughs> I was in complete, it was, I was completely lost in the bhav, in the emotion of, of, of what this priest created around, it was in Mother Mary's church, it was, that was uh, the, the uh, deity that was worshipped there, and I just was, in, I felt completely embraced by Mother Mary. There was no difference between that mother that I had been with in India and the Mother Mary that I was sitting with in this church. So, it is so true that suddenly we were able to see, after having this experience uh, in India, waking up to Western, you know, I mean, obviously the mystical parts. Although this was just, you know, this, this priest was by no means a mystic. So, uh, there's more, he talks more about uh, habits of thoughts and dealing with depression in this thing. That's, it's also really great information um, you know, talking about our, you know, that heavy pack, you know, hiking pack of personality that we carry around and can't turn it off. And, uh, basically, I think he ends this thing saying, I can't help anyone else until I'm peaceful, loving. So our first job is to work on ourselves for sure and get, get our own houses in order. But again, the most fascinating part of this talk is this, um, you know, it is amazing how much we were turned off by Western religions that we were forced into. And then after being in the East, all of a sudden, we could see them with new eyes. 
pretty amazing. And here is this talk from, again, it's from 1970 in uh, Franklin, New Hampshire. And uh, Ramdas, here and now. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It may seem strange to you that I should be sitting before you cross-legged in Indian style and start my remarks with a quotation from Matthew from the words of Jesus. It doesn't seem at all strange to me. Because as I've gone more and more deeply into each tradition, I have found that they keep coming in circles. And I keep coming back to that which is spirit, which lies behind all of the religions. I am studying in the Hindu tradition And all of you may not realize, but the Hindu tradition is so broad in scope that it hardly can be considered a finite religion as such. There is nothing in Hinduism that rejects Christ as the Son of God. And there is nothing that I have involved myself with in the East that in any way has required that I refute any of my Western tradition, my religious tradition. The reason I went to the East was because I, as a social scientist, a psychologist, had realized that we in the West did not know enough. We did not know enough to provide man with the wisdom necessary for inner peace. That as sophisticated as our theories were, they didn't provide man with a total feeling of fulfillment. And I, as a social scientist, could not hear the voice of religion. And when I looked about me, I saw that most of my fellow Westerners had relegated religion to a Sunday morning experience with a sort of gentle moral reminder, but that its message often was not profound enough to touch the inner places where they lived. And I went to India to find whether or not there were those living who knew things about man that we needed to know. And what I found 
were methods which I wish to share with you tonight. And what were the goals of these methods, it turned out? The goals are contained right in the title of the method. The method is called yoga. Yoga means union. Yoga means union with God. And I come back into the Western tradition And now when I read the following, I can hear the message. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all the mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is this, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. It seems strange indeed that I had to go to the Himalayas to break the barrier of cynicism in my heart to allow me to come back and hear the tradition of the spirit contained for Christianity in the first commandment and for the Hebrew religion in which I was raised as the Hebrew Shema Yisroel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echod. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It goes on to say, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. See, when I heard those expressions before, those statements, that all seemed so nice but so abstract, and what did it have to do with my daily life? Very little. I needed the bridge. I needed a bridge to take me from my material, rational world to a place inside myself where those kinds of statements could affect my moment-to-moment -moment daily life. And that turned out to be, for me, what the science of yoga is about. Let me make that bridge for you also. As a psychologist and as a psychotherapist, I could see that each of us would get our minds into a certain place, our thought process into a certain place, where we would tend to see life day by day in a very repetitive fashion with a set of habits of thought that we were, we were incapable of breaking through. Take a mood like a depression. How many of you have known or known somebody who has had depression? What happens when you experience depression? You get up, the sun may be shining, but it's as if there is a haze everywhere. People who love you may come towards you and all you see is, all you feel is a deep sadness. And you realize, you even know, there is a place in you that knows that you can say, well, today I'm depressed. Today I'm depressed. But it doesn't get you out of the depression.
you have a financial problem and you think about it and you see that the solution lies in a certain way and now you've done your thinking and you've seen the solution now the efficient thing at that point is to turn off the problem and live the next moment with as much beauty and love and openness and compassion as you can but how many of us are capable of doing that? you get preoccupied with the problem and you can't turn it off and your mind becomes like a broken record it just keeps going around and around in the same groove you take a physical sickness you feel ill you go to the doctor he treats the illness you are doing the best you can do for the treatment now any further thought you, can, you attend to that illness is merely intensifying the illness in fact because it's increasing your tension which is making the natural healing processes of the body more difficult all of us carry around with us these um, it's like a heavy pack of personality of who we are and how it all is and how it could be better and how if we only didn't have a mole in our left cheek it would all be beautiful in life or if we didn't have a financial burden or if, we, or if it was all different somehow and we seem completely ineffective to turn it off we can't put our consciousness in any different place and yet you can see how erratic your own thoughts are for example you can be thinking of something very troublesome and be very depressed or say let's use fatigue that's a better example you're very tired feel heavy fatigue and then something comes along that you've been waiting for that you really wanted to do and suddenly the fatigue is gone just gone just like that you don't know where it went just disappeared what is that all about how is it that your mind can be that erratic and how is it that sometimes it can hold on so tenaciously when you'd like to be able to change it now there are a number of ways in the West we've dealt with these problems one of them is we say well that's life that's the usual way those that don't want to accept that one may go to a psychiatrist in which he will try to see, he will try to um, substitute a set of thoughts for the ones you've got that will make your life somewhat happier or you may go to a doctor and get some tranquilizers or some energizers to make your outlook on life more euphoric or more calm what I saw when I did psychotherapy was that I really had nothing to offer my quote patients that was really uh, a model of the universe where they were going to find that kind of fulfillment because I myself had no faith in any system other than my own rational mind what could I offer them furthermore I had the haunting suspicion that all I was doing was giving them all my problems but I was good at it and they weren't the games of life so I could get them to look at the world my way and then you'd win according to the way I win but I knew I was sort of losing too because it didn't feel quite right but after all they came to me and they said I, they were sick and I was the doctor therefore I must be healthy everybody told me I was healthy my patients came to me they looked at me as if I were healthy but inside was that same gnawing doubt that same feeling I don't know the answer I don't know really what to offer you I can offer you some cuteness of mind but that isn't going to be enough there's a, a line also from Matthew 
Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own? Or wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. What I in fact, in fact realized was that I was a hypocrite, that I just was not myself fulfilled enough as a human being to offer solace to anybody that my message was impure. Now most of you, when you think of the term yoga, think in terms of body, uh, a set of body exercises coming from the East. That is primarily because that is the aspect of yoga that has come to the West most and is most prevalent. In fact, yoga means uh, something far more profound than that. It is a way of disciplining the mind. It is a way of calming the mind and centering it. It is a way of calming the body and working with the nerves of the body in such a way as to bring the body and mind into harmony. It is designed specifically to allow a person to move back, albeit momentarily, from his own drama into a place where he sees with an eye greater than his own. For he who would save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. For what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world but suffer the loss of his own soul? And unless a man be born again of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And unless you turn and become like little children, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now very, very directly, yoga is a method. It's a set of methods for entering into the kingdom of heaven. And what is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven is a state of awareness, a state of consciousness, where you will see your life and the universe around you from the perspective of the spirit. Let me show you how this works. The way you think about things is very much affected by who you hang out with, who you spend your time with. If you spend your time with a lot of people who are primarily concerned about economic hardships, your thoughts are filled with problems of economic hardship. But all of you know people who have very little means who are preoccupied with their economic condition, and you know others who are of very simple living, who have the same economic wherewithal and yet are not at all preoccupied with, with their economic hardships. Now what is the difference between hanging out with one and with the other, or being with one and the other? 
The fact is, when you're with a person who, despite economic difficulties or physical difficulties, is appreciating moment by moment the beauty of the universe and of daily life, you come away and there's joy in your heart and you feel happy and you feel uplifted. And you say, I really like to be around that person. You hang around somebody who is depressed, who is terif terrifically preoccupied with their own problems, and you come away feeling heavy and your bones ache and you're extremely tired and you want a little peace and quiet and rest. Now, if you know that, if you know that and really understand that and understand that if you're going to put your consciousness into a place from which you can view your life from a, another plane of awareness, one of the things you're going to have to do is hang out with other people, be around other people who are looking at the universe from that place. And that is specifically why one of the methods of yoga is study of the words of realized being. When I read the words of Christ, when I read the words of Moses, when I read the words of Buddha and of Muhammad, I am reading the words of beings who know how to look at it from another place. And it's like paying a visit to them. And I come away saying, wow, look at how it all looks from here. In other words, what the process is, is changing your own perspective point. Changing the vantage point from which you look at the world. And so one of the methods of yoga is study. So you read the Bibles of the world. The Bibles of the world. You hang out with these people. You literally hang out with them. And so in the room where I live are pictures of Buddha and Christ and Ramakrishna and, and uh, uh, Moses and uh, Abraham. And these are beings who are my friends, literally my friends. This is a, this is a technique. It's a method. It's a method. But then there are some much more mechanical, systematic methods. One word you've heard a great deal about recently, I'm sure, is the term meditation. Now, in the West, when we use the word meditation, we most generally mean reflection. It means like meditate on love. It means think about people you love and think about love and the relations of love. That's reflection. You're reflecting around a topic. Meditation is a much more specific technique with a specific object. The idea is to calm your mind down and make it sufficiently one-pointed so that you are not at the whim of all of these broken record thoughts in your own head that keep catching you all the time. For example, I might sit and watch my own breath Go in and out, in and out. And I say, for the next half hour, I will do nothing but watch my breath go in and out. And any thought I think during that period will be irrelevant. I've protected everything. There are no fires that are going to burn up. There are no pots boiling on the stove. All the children are safe. I can sit down in a quiet place, the whole scene is in order, I will now spend the next 30 minutes calming my mind. I will do nothing but watch my breath go up and down. Now there's one little voice in me that says, how absolutely trivial, how absurd, you went and got a PhD and you've got all this knowledge and you're sitting watching your breath go in and out. Don't you have anything better to do? You should go out and work. <laughs> And there's another thing in me that reminds me that until I get rid of the beam in my own eye, I'm not going to help anybody get rid of the moat in theirs. 
And that as long as my own head is that agitated so that it's at the whim of all kinds of things, what have I got to offer anybody? I can't offer somebody calmness until I'm calm. I can't offer somebody a way to peace until I am a peaceful being. I cannot offer somebody else the way to love until I am love. Till love is in my heart. So the yogi says very simply, your first job is to work on yourself. And the greatest thing you do for another human being first is to get your own house in order. Because if somebody comes to me and they are agitated and caught in their drama and in their suffering, until I can have that greater perspective, until I can stand back and see how it is, what have I got to offer? I can just offer them my melodrama for theirs. You think you've got problems? Listen to mine. I can say that to them. It's just like when a child comes to you and is hurt, or a child's feelings are hurt, and you can see, you saw the whole game and the play with the children, and you saw what happened, and you understand it all, and there is a place in you which is completely apart from it, and yet you have total compassion for how it is with that child and with the other child. You see why it happened and how it all is, and from that vantage point, you have the wisdom to offer a solution. You have the wisdom to do something for somebody else. But if you're one of the other children, all embroiled in the skirmish yourself, what have you got to offer? All you've got is your own egocentric predicament to offer. And in a way, a parent has only to offer a child the wisdom that comes from their own being able to get out of the position of being a parent and understand how it is with parents and how it is with children. And a child can have compassion for his parents' predicament only when he can get out of his own egocentric predicament of being the child that is being put upon and misunderstood. Everybody is in their own egocentric predicament. You walk down the street and you see everybody doing their drama. Everybody's telling you who they are by their method of walking, their method of talking, their smiles. Somebody's walking down the street saying, I'm a good woman, I'm a good woman, I'm a good woman, I'm a good woman. <laughs> Somebody else is walking down the street saying, life has been hard on me, life has been hard on me, life has been hard on me, life has been hard on me. Somebody else walking down the street saying, it's going to rain, it's going to rain, definitely going to rain, can tell it's going to rain. Somebody else walking down the street saying, wow, look at it all. Oh, look at how beautiful God's work is. Wow, look at that. They tell you who they are all the time. We each each have our own drama. We come, we're already cast. Central casting has put us all in our parts. We're all playing out our drama. This podcast has been brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate all the support for the Foundation and for Ramdas's work, and we hope that you will continue that support. You can go to Ramdas.org and click on the Donate Now button and follow the prompts. Thank you.